We will bring in a very special guest right now. Yes. Looking sharp as always. Thank you. Bernie Williams. Oh, I don't know about the sharp. No, no, no you're very great. sharp. Oh, Bernie. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you look that. terrific. Man. That was a little that jazz musician look. There you go. It's kind of rare to see him without a glove, bat, or guitar. Right? That is true. That's right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. One of those three things should be in your hand at all times. <laughs> not a microphone, though. <laughs> no, Why not? Why? Why not? Now, you, uh, you obviously watched the series. What would you take away? I was very frustrated. Uh, I uh, still think that, you know, uh, even though... The Yankees came up short. They still had a, a, you know, they still have a pretty good year. You know, when you win 100 games, uh, it still tells you that, uh, you know, you're doing some things right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but unfortunately, New York and especially the Yankees don't get judged by the regular season. They get judged by the uh, postseason and the results. And I think at that point, particular point in the game for this team, uh, they definitely need to make some adjustments. They had a lot of a lot riding on. Uh, uh, you know, this lineup to be productive. Uh, and uh, I think it was a lot to put on, on uh, Andujar and, and Glaber, you know, to try to carry that team and be part of that lineup. Uh, I think it's definitely going to be a great learning experience for them. And, I, I mean, I don't know their mindset because I was not in the clubhouse, but I know what it did for me to be uh, caught short in, in this series. In 95, we got uh, cut short in Seattle. Mm -hmm. We ended up winning in 96. In 97, I made the last out in that Cleveland uh, wild card thing, uh, you know, and uh, I ended up having one of the best runs of my career, 98, 99, 2000, even 2001. So my experience will tell me that these guys are going to take this loss and they're going to make a lot out of it and they're going to work so much harder in, in the mm -hmm. offseason and uh, I I predict that this team is going to be a much different team uh, next year and they're going to uh, hopefully take it a lot farther than they did this year. Didn't happen to you that often but you know last year they go to game seven of the league championship series. This season they, they took a step back. How, how difficult is that to, all right, you, you learn from losing but they're going to look back and go, well, we thought we were going to take the next step, and we actually took a step backwards. It, every, yeah, but it, 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 I don't think I should look at it that way because in short series, anything can happen. And I think you know, you can lose in the first game of the you know on the first series in the wild cards. As you can lose in the World Series, you can lose in the, in the American uh, League uh, Championship. Uh, and it, to me, it's all the same because it's just short series, and anything could happen in those short series. The thing is about getting up to that point in the regular season and, and making you know have that opportunity to be. Uh, part of that postseason, uh, you know, those postseason teams. Uh, you can look at it like uh, that it was a step back, but if you look at it at that, you know, in that light, I think you're missing a little bit of, of what the team was all about this year. There's a lot of positives that I can take from this team, uh, you know, this season. Uh, and, the, you know, like I said before, they won 100 games, man. It was just... Boston had just an unbelievable season, and uh, you know they're they're playing inspired, and that's kind of hard, hard to uh, hard to deal with that. You, I mean, you lived on both sides of the street here because uh, the, the championships we won in ninety six, ninety eight, ninety nine, two thousand. That team made home runs, but it was not a home run hitting team. There were hits up and down the order. Then after two thousand and one, you guys started getting eliminated in rounds because that was a home run. Um, predicted team. They, that's how they scored runs. I think home runs go away in the postseason, certainly in big moments. Can a team win just being a home run hitting team? I do not believe so. And this is the reason why. I think in, in postseason, more importantly than any other part of the season, I think you are hanging on small details and nuances. And some of these things can make such a big impact in games. Things that may not be, you know, uh, I, I don't know, uh, looked up in, in, in stats. You know, yep. moving a runner over at the right time. You know, making the right out. You know, throwing, you know, somebody out. Making a good defensive play. These things are so uh, significant in, uh, you know, in postseason that they can mean the difference between winner and losing. And I think for hitters, I think, you know, I'd rather take a complete hitter that would take a, a, a quality at bat, even if it's a walk. You take a quality at bat, you know, rather than somebody that is just trying to hit the ball out of the yard and then, you know, whatever happens, happens. Well, I think, you know, there was, uh, you know, it, it, in our teams, in our era, we had guys that were not in any leader division, you know, offensively, home runs or RBIs, but we were guys that would grind out at bats. You know, mm -hmm. we had like 
five, six, seven, eight, ten pitch at bats, and then we would wear out the opposition trying to get to that bullpen mm -hmm. early. Uh, and uh, we were guys that were hitting 20 home runs, 20 to 25 home runs, maybe 75 to 85 RBIs all across the board, but we were tough hitters. And the sum of the parts was the thing that made the lineup. You know, if you had a guy like Brocious hitting ninth and still, you know, being the MVP of the World Series, what does it tell you about the rest of the lineup? You know, we were guys that were grinding at bats, working uh, walks, and then just right. waiting, you know, waiting for and, our, our, the, you know, our opportunity the, to produce. The problem with the birdie saying, and I guess it irritates me about baseball, is I'm not sure any of that applies anymore. Working counts. Why? To get to the bullpen. Nobody wants to go to the bullpen. Some teams' bullpens are better than the starting pitchers. You don't dread going to the bullpen. In order to work a count, Bernie, you have to have a two-strike approach. These guys don't have it. No, they They're don't. trying to hit a home run 0-2 just like they would if they were up 2-0 in the count. Well, the ninth inning is the best example of it. I mean, both Sanchez and Stanton, you, knew, uh, you almost knew were getting outs when Kimbrell couldn't buy a strike. Yes. Yes, that but is I true. I thought Sanchez had a good at bat. Uh, I, I think, he, I think, he had had a I think Sanchez came within inches right. of, of hitting a, a grand slam. Right. And that that's nothing. That's something that you cannot do much about. I mean, I remember you know uh, watching that uh, 14 back. You know, and and. Uh, having Kyle Jastrzemski going out, you know, with the game on the line and then just missing a pitch, right. you know, when he has come, uh, you know, through so many times for that, for that team. So the only thing that you can do is put yourself in a good position to have a good at bat. And then, you know, sometimes you'll be successful more times than not. If you have the talent, you will be successful. But you have to be able to sort of carry that thing that you know, it may not go your way. But you, the only thing that you can do is put yourself in a good position to have a good at bat. The, uh, the thing I remember about you and your teammates have told me that in big moments, you didn't, le you didn't freak out. I mean, it wasn't like the game sped up for you. It was still very chill when you came to the plate. Do you see that with these Yankee players? Do you think that the game was speeding up for, for Giancarlo Stanton? Well, I think, this is what I think. I think that when you are thinking you know, to go yard every at-bat, mm -hmm. it limits your ability to see the whole picture. Like, you can help a team some, you know, a, a lot better you know, in terms of having a good at-bat. And what is, what is it a good at-bat? You know, for a slugger, if they don't want to pitch to you, <laughs> don't swing at that pitch. It's you just you know you, you take the initiative to work the count and make the pitcher work and not really guess you know to see if you know I'm going to swing at this pitch no matter where it is because I think it's going to be a strike. Uh, maybe you know sort of work the count. You know just kind of see these guys and and uh, you know trying to hit the ball where it's pitch. Trying to I mean these guys don't even these guys nowadays they don't really need to pull the ball to hit it out. They don't, have, they don't need to have that mentality right. of, I need to hit the ball hard to hit it out because they're so strong. They can go the other way. They can hit the ball straight away center field. So that particular thing about hitting the ball out should be out of their minds. They should just think about making good contact with the baseball. And if you are hitting it in the right angle, obviously it's going to go out. But still, if you hit it hard somewhere, you could keep the things going. And, and hitting is contagious, you know. So you get a guy on base, you walk, you know, you get a double, you get a base hit, you get so much havoc for the defense and the pitching. And just, in my mind, the way that I see the game played, the sum of the parts is what makes... You know, our team was about what it's what made our team dangerous. You know, you can have a guy, you know, having just the, the you know, the things rolling. You know, some guy gets on, somebody gets, you know, gets him over. You know, then you get another hit, you get a double, then you get somebody hitting, you know, and just kind of keeps the pressure going. And uh, to me, that was the way that I learned how to play and, and, and how our, te and our teams were successful that way. Joe Torrey. As opposed to what's happening now. I mean, could Joe manage now? Because he went, yeah, there wasn't a lot of analytics when you played, right? So d is there a manager like that anymore? Does that even apply to today's game of what made him a good manager? Of course. Of course. But how do you do it then? You have to play the game. Just play the game. You know, what's the right way to play in the game? You know, you still have to hit the ball. You still have to play the game with, you know, with, with character and dignity. Play it the right way. Hustle all the time. Uh, and just, to me, having good at-bats, which not necessarily mean hitting the ball out. 
you know, having a good at bats mm -hmm. is mean, you know, working the count, just hitting the ball solidly, and, uh, you know, take some data for your next at bat and your next at bat. It makes it a lot difficult these days because maybe, you know, to your point, uh, you know, starting pitching is not the way it used to be. You know, some people will give you three, four innings, and then you go right into the bullpen, but they still need to throw strikes, you know. They still need to, you know, come to you, and I think we did a really good job in making the game come to us as but opposed to kind of like reaching out. We're talking with Bernie Williams here on the Michael K. Show, but contrary to what you're saying, that it could still happen, your former manager, Buck Showalter, I was talking with him the last time the Orioles were in town, and he said, you can't tell players what to do anymore. He said, they're not going to move runners over because they're paid to hit home runs. Mm -hmm. There's no shame in striking out anymore. They don't mm -hmm. care. He said, for, for them to lay down a bunt or take the extra base, that's not what they're getting paid on. The game pays on home runs and strikeouts. It's weird. Well, I think if that's the case, then we're going into a really, really interesting philosophical discussion yeah. here. Yeah, I know. Is it about the team winning, or is it about the player having good numbers? But the analytics people think that that's the best way to win is just hit home runs and strike out. Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, you can justify any kind of theory that you want. Right. If you want to play the game, you know, and people that have played the game, I think that it takes a little bit of everything. It takes a guy that can move the runner over because it's just a moment in time that it will require you to do something special. You don't have to hit home runs all the time to win games. You know, there's, the game, we have sort of uh, minimized and sort of limit the game to just a couple of things that you have to do. You have to get, hit the ball out. You have to do this. You have to do that. But the game is so much more complex. Mm -hmm. There's so much more strategy that, that comes with the game of baseball that makes it the game it is. And I think nowadays we're, we're just kind of like sort of condensing the thing and just kind of, you know, sort of, uh, you know, Pay more emphasis on on certain things, but we're kind of like neglecting, you know, what make this game great. And mm. to me, it's just playing a full game and being a complete player. Yeah, it's so frustrating because I don't, I don't, I don't think that's the way they unfortunately look at it anymore. What's going on in the players' minds right now? Season's over. Very disappointing. Do you, do you shut down? Do you start working immediately? What's the schedule like after you have a disappointing loss like this? It depends on your level of frustration. Uh, to me, I mean, I can only talk about myself. When I made the last out in 1997 uh, on a bonehead <laughs> at bat, you know, I swing at the first pitch, Jose Mesa, uh, you know, sort of hung a slider, and I just kind of went for it, and I just sort of popped it up to left field, and it was such a great situation in the game you know for me to show up and kind of come you know come clutch i took it to heart so bad that the whole off season for me was I mean, you could have you could have played the rocky theme every day mm. <laughs> and that would be me working so hard in my game uh you know trying to make sure that i was uh, at the best of my game and uh what that moment of frustration did in, in 97 it propelled me to have you know some of the best runs that i've ever had in my career in years you know 98 99 2000 i i had pretty good years but it, it came out of that frustration from 97 so if they have any kind of inclination of thinking the way the same way that I did, this team uh, is certainly going to take this experience and uh, you know try to make something out of it for next year. I want to run something by you. I've been so impressed the way Aaron Judge carries himself. I think he's almost a perfect athlete for this day and age. He doesn't style. He doesn't pimp his home runs. He doesn't show anybody up. Hardly does anything wrong. Then I was kind of surprised after Game Two. He walks past the Red Sox uh, clubhouse, you know, as you walk to the bus, yes. with a boombox booming New York, New York. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like trolling them. Yeah. And then when they win yesterday, yep. they're playing New York, New York during the celebration, spraying champagne around the clubhouse. Were you surprised that Aaron did that? And do you think that could be a motivating force for the Red Sox? Well, I, you know, you know anything could happen in the heat of the moment. Right. And I think, you know, when you have... The passion for the game that Aaron has, and uh, you know, I, I would assume the rest of the team has. You can get a little carried away, mm -hmm. and uh, but you know, things like that don't bother me as much. But what I tell you is, is this: it does affect the opposition because I remember, uh, you know, playing o in Oakland, mm -hmm. and uh, that series that we played in Oakland. I'm kind of trying to remember the year. I think it was '98 or '99. 
you know, they happened to broadcast the uh, the press conferences as we were doing batting practice. And they had, you know, the Oakland Stadium, the Oakland Coliseum, and they had people there talking, you know, answering questions. And I remember uh, Eric Chavez uh, being interviewed and saying something alluding to the fact that we were kind of like the old guard and they were the new guard coming in. And it was time for us to sort of step aside and have them, you know, have their moment in, in the, you know, shiny moment in the sun. And as we're watching this and batting practice, we're like saying, what is he talking about? You know, and I would like to believe that that moment in time sort of add fuel to the fire. And mm -hmm. I think I was, you know, it just made it more not only a thing that we had to win for the city and the team, it, it made it a little bit more personal to me. And, in, in, you know, obviously it, it, it made me play a little bit harder because I was taking it personal. It was not a business. It was not about the game. It was about these guys trying to show us off. The, the, you know. the, see, that's what I didn't understand. I, I, t I totally hear what you're saying. It's just not Aaron. That's not the way he is. Yeah. That's why when I heard it, I was go, wow. But he's, he's, he's a like young player, all. and he's a young player, and he's passionate about the game. Maybe he heard something from them, right? You know, uh, that was not publicized or was not, you know, sort of, you know, uh, reported. That the players knew. That, that the players right. knew, and maybe he just kind of reacted to that. But uh, you know, at the same time, uh, that's why I'm such a proponent of uh, you know old school, you know, not showing everybody off and, and not really talking about just doing your talking on the field and doing all that stuff because it really worked for me and uh it is something that it's you know uh, i don't know it's it, the change the game is kind of changing that way you know with the advent of social media there's a lot of you know all these people you know making commentary and making you know a, a lot of you know a lot of things uh and, and sometimes they don't take the time to sort of Stay back and right. say, what are the ramifications of this thing that I'm doing right now? Before I don't have, send. yeah, I don't have exactly. I don't have the uh, the the you know the sort of the middle, the buffer from you know from my media relations guy. I don't have you know a you know a reporter with a microphone in my. I, now I can just go here and say whatever I need to say and just send it. Right. You know, with no filter, no nothing. I mean, that might be good for, for media and for publishing and for marketing, but that sometimes these things would have a, a repercussion on the, on, the, on the other team. All right, we're talking with Bernie Williams. This Friday night, that's October 12th, Bernie Williams and his all-star band return to New York City with a concert at the Schimmel Center at Pace University. Special VIP meet and greet tickets are available. We get the best premium seats in the house, and you meet up with Bernie after the show for photos. Plus, he'll take you out to dinner. No, that's true. That's not true. <laughs> Plus, he'll be signing CDs and other uh, music merchandise. Now, for tickets and info, call the Schimmel Center box office at 212-346-1715, or you can find links to tickets at Bernie51.com or on Bernie's Facebook page. You can also find him on Instagram at Bernie Williams Official and Twitter at BW51Official. Tickets are currently at low as twenty nine dollars. We're going fast. So tell me about the concert. All over the place. It's a lot of Man, stuff, right? All over the place. Yes, I've had an opportunity to uh, do a lot of great things this summer. You know, playing. You know, playing at your your gig. That's you know, always was, fun. Oh, that was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, had a, a chance to go to Savannah and play at the Savannah Jazz Festival. Came to NJ Pack and played with uh, this world renowned bass player named Kristen McBride uh, with his big band. Played a couple of numbers. You know, and uh, uh, an event uh, uh, a tribute to Sarah. Vaughn and Ella Fitzgerald and uh, Billie Holiday. So I'm moving myself into this sort of music thing in the mm. city and uh, beyond the city, and it's working. I mean, I'm working as hard as I did as a music, uh, as a baseball player to try to, you know, uh, make some sort of an impact in this in this industry. It's, it's not really easy, man. It's very competitive. Is it as fulfilling for you as when you were a player? Is oh, it yeah. filling that void? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it. I mean, uh, you know, the amount of music and the amount of talent that is, you know, in this city alone, uh, you know, it makes you work hard. And the, obviously networking and the people that you know that can lead you to other opportunities. But the fact of the matter is that you still have to play. You still have to be ready. And uh, as ready as I was, you know, as a baseball player, you know, it's a daily thing. You work on your batting practice. You work on your swings, you know, whether it's soft toss or, you know, whatever. Uh, in music is the same thing. You got to make sure that your chops, mm -hmm. as they call it, us cats, I guess. <laughs> yeah. You jazz cats and you your jazz chops. Cats. Well, actually, I mean, it's jazz, but it's all kinds of music. You know, you you got to you got to be ready for when the opportunity comes. You don't waste it, and you make the best out of it. And that, that's what I'm trying to do. All right, so this Friday, it's at the Schimmel yeah, Center man. at Pace University again for tickets. Two one two three four six one seven one five, or you can find links to tickets at Bernie51.com.
You're great at what you do. Yeah, you're really you tremendous. You come in. This is oh, not some. So this much, is not some man. jabroni athlete pretending <laughs> no. they can play. <laughs> no. And people like feel bad for them, so they show up. This and is he, a guy who's got chops. Right. Can play. And, he, right. and he can do it a lot longer than he played baseball too. Absolutely, right? man. That's <laughs> the one thing that I really appreciate about this. And that there's in baseball, I kind of knew where I was and how much you know what I could do, what I couldn't do, what was I good at, and why you know I, things that I would stay away from. In music, there's it hasn't really been a ceiling for me. You always in this sort of mentality that there's always something to learn from great players and the ability to play with different people in different times. It's just, I'm just living the dream, man. It's just an, an amazing uh, experience for well, me. Well, what Michael Jordan said, the ceiling is the roof, and the roof on Friday is going to be the Schimmel <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. you go. Go. That, huh? That's it, Love man. it. Beautiful. It. Bernie, great to see you. Thank you so much, man. Thank you for having Bernie. me. Thank Michael you. Michael on 98.7 ESPN, brought to you by GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Visit them at geico.com.